Luz Gonzalez Cadea from Universidad de San Andres and CONICET. I hope I didn't butcher that. <laughs> Thank you <coughs> very much. <coughs> My name is Luz. I'm come from Argentina. And I will present a work in which we study the intersection between intergroup bias and third-party punishment decisions in children. So, to, to, be, uh, to be sure that we are, what we are talking about, a definition of third-party punishment uh, is a human, human's willingness to pay the personal cost to punish others or those who, buy, who violate fireners uh, distribution norms, even, even when the transgression does not uh, directly affect the, obser the observer. So, in this example, A makes a harm to B, and there is a bystander or observer or judge who is C who punish uh, to A and also pay a cost to punish uh, to A. So, he or she is not affected by the harm. Okay. Or in typical uh, third-party third punishment task, uh, A makes a selfish distribution between him or herself and B. So the, the interventions of third parties to rectify injustice is a concern of our system of justice. And recent, I, know, I guess that you know that there are recent studies that uh, focus on understand how this um, construct, the third party punishment, development in infancy. Because it's important, or I think, is it important to understand the mechanisms of third parties in children to shed light about this development, the developmental process that underlies some of the principles of justice that organize our institutions and societies. So, how does TPP, I will say, third, I will use TPP for third party punishment, uh, abbreviation. Uh, how does it develop? This is a recent review to synthesize the literature, the most recent literature on third party punishment in children. The um, foundation of third party punishment behaviors start uh, in very early in, in infants. In infant. Toddlers, for instance, toddlers expect that bystanders uh, act to punish uh, those who violate its norms. And when they are, when children are at the, when preschoolers, for instance, they protest and even tattling when there is, when someone deviates a norm or someone, for instance, are selfish with another um, person. And in middle age, there are some, most of the literature shows that uh, around middle age, children incur on third-party punishment decisions. But there is some literature that shows that children incur in third-party punishment um, decisions even um, in preschool years. So, but the truth is that um, this punishment is not impartial, as children typically punish more some transgressions or some individuals more than others. Especially between or the one factor that influences uh, the punishment is the in group in the, in the ident identification. So intergroup bias modulates this type of behavior. So the point is um, how will you punish when you have to punish an interaction between two in-group members, or an interaction between two out-group members, or an interaction between an, um, an in-group um, um, transgressor with an out-group victim, or with an out-group um, transgressor with uh, um, out, sorry, an out-group transgression with an in-group victim. So is it important to understand the intersection between intergroup bias and TPP? because it could shed light on how and why children incur in this type of behavior. But is it, um, the problem is when you look at the um, literature, you see that the result is mixed. So some studies report that children punish more uh, frequently in-group members than out-group members, but other studies show the opposite. For instance, in that study, 
um, Judkin and collaborator found that when children, when young children, uh, children between three and four years, years old, are in a position of authority, they punish more in-group members than out-group members, a phenomenon that is called in-group policy uh, bias. <clears throat> but these papers show the opposite uh, phenomenon, the in-group favoritism bias in middle-aged uh, children, by which uh, children punish more out-group members than in-group members. So an alternative or a, a, a um, framework that could explain this disparate results on intergroup bias in TPP uh, are these two hypotheses. Um, one of hypothesis is the norm focus hypothesis, who predicts that because groups serve to foster cooperations, uh, children or people or individuals preferentially uh, prefer in-group members and also punish harder in-group members or in-group transgressors more than out-group transgressors. Contrarily, the mere preference hypothesis predicts that because groups are closely linked to the self, people preferentially prefer or, or like in-group individuals and punish more harshly out-group members than in-group transgressors or in-group um, transgression members. So in our study, we wanted first to test these uh, two opposing hypotheses for intergroup bias in TPP. Second, we wanted to explore, for the first time, there wasn't, to our knowledge, no previous study that explored the mechanism associated with such biases by exploring or by including both costly and non-costly TPP decisions and also by measuring reaction times. And third, uh, the uh, to, to explore and to test the developmental trajectories of both decisions and mechanisms. So, uh, we evaluate participants from Argentina, children between 6 and 11 years of age. Uh, we take data from schools and from a museum. Uh, and we make this task, we, we, we call the judge of candy task, and was an adaptation from Jordan um, and collaborators. And collaborators. In this task, in the first part, children first um, let's select whether to be part of the green or the orange uh, group, and then we check uh, whether our group manipulations uh, was effective or not, and then uh, children play the, the, the task, the TPP task, in which they have to, uh, to choose whether to accept or to reject an allocation offer make, uh, made by an actor to a, a recipient. Um, the actor decided how to distribute some resources that were candies, uh, and the uh, recipient just takes these, um, these candies, and a combination between in-group and out-group members were in two blocks of the tax that combine uh, in-groups and, and out-group members in the role of actors and recipients. So, if the participant uh, accepts the allocation offer, both of participants will receive the candies, but if she uh, rejects the allocation offer, neither of the participants will receive the candies. The participants were told that the actor uh, have decided how to distribute the candy, but this decision it hasn't or didn't have any effect until the participant decided if this allocation offer will be done or not. So, um, each block contains seven trials and we include fair and selfish trials. Fair trials include uh, the actor decided to give three uh, candies, pieces of candy to the, act, to the recipient and keeps three pieces of candy to him or her. And selfish actors, the selfish, sorry, allocation offers, the actor keeps six pieces of candy for himself and gives anything to the recipient. But there, is, there were two types of allocation. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> oh, you didn't see, sorry. Ah, oh, yeah, you see the mark. <laughs> but now it's, ah, here. This was a, um, 
sorry, there was two types of selfish offers. A costly offer, it was an offer that if the participant decided to reject this offer, he will pay it with one piece of candy that were given to her at the beginning of the task in this bag. If she decided to uh, punish or to reject this um, offer, she has to put one of the pieces of candy in this red, red box. Um, and she has, if she accepts the allocation offered, she puts all the candies in this heart. That means that was the heart that we told children that uh, they will uh, give to the participants, to the members that will come to play later. And in non consti trials, if the participant decided to reject the offer, neither, neither participant will receive the candies, but she doesn't have to pay anything uh, for this, um, for, for this uh, rejection. So, which were our hypotheses? We have hypothesized that in costly decisions will be more, uh, will take more time to children to decide. So, children will take more longer reaction times and this will be associated with a more deliberative or conflictive processes, processes. Uh, and given that children with age um, calibrate to, or learn how to calibrate better moral, personal and group concerns, we um, hypothesize that this deliberative process should decrease with age. And also previous study found that in-group policy bias was observed in costly decisions rather than in non costly decisions in children. So we expected that maybe costly decisions could be associated with um, this such of, of bias. Regarding non costly decisions, we expected to be more associated with shorter um, reaction times and with more automatic processes and will remain stable with age. And previous studies in adults show that uh, was automatic processes was associated with in-group favoritism bias. So these are our results. <coughs> Sorry. So you can have a look first. <laughs> um, we observe here, we observe that children, we, our result confirmed their norm focus hypothesis because children exhibit an in-group in -group policy bias instead of an in-group favoritism bias because they punish more in-group members than out-group members. We observed this, in, but this phenomenon, this bias was absent in children between 10 and 11, 11 years and was observed in both costly and non-costly uh, decisions. Regarding the mechanisms, um, constantly with decisions, this, we observed the same in-group policy biases in reaction times as a more deliberative process. So, uh, children took more time to decide whether to decide to punish in-group members than out-group members. And even they took more time during costly trials than in non-costly trials. And this effect, this bias, this in-group policy bias um, in reaction times was higher in costly than non-costly offers. But difference from decisions was present in all children, even the, um, the oldest children. Uh, as, a de as a more deliberative or conflictive process. So, a discussion, our first time, was to test these two op op opposite hypotheses for intergroup bias in TPP. Our result, as I, as I said, support the norm focus hypothesis because children exhibit in group policy instead of in group favoritism bias. But it is true that our results were uh, different from Jordan, who found an in group favoritism bias. Why? We, we think that there were two differences between our procedures and Jordan procedures that may explain these disparate results. In our task, we in haste, also we, we call the task the judge of candy task, we in haste the authority role of the participants and also costly option were in haste with this exclamation task and with, uh, with contrasting non-costly and costly task. And these two um, features were the features that um, enhanced this type of bias uh, that was presented in previous studies as a feature relevant for this type of bias. Second, um, previous studies in adults show that in-group favoritism bias emerged 
when the selfishness or the deviant behavior is more ambiguous. Um, and uh, for in our task, um, this, is, this um, selfishness was really evident and we was really transparent. Yeah, and regarding the mechanisms, uh, we found that in-group policing involves a more deliberative than automatic process, but is, is it true that we exactly didn't mean um, an automatic versus a, refle uh, a deliberative process because our task or oh, the option was, was self pass So maybe future studies that include um, time limits, that include uh, a manipulation of time limit or dual task could contrast hypotheses between whether uh, children use an automatic or more deliberative process. So in our task, children just have enough or no limit to respond. And last, we found that um, in-group policing was absent in other children, uh, and we understand that this is, um, this is because children with age uh, learn how to better calibrate between moral, personal, and group concerns. And to finish, um, I would like to think about the implication of this work. I would like to think that this kind of intergroup bias that's emerged more as a deliberative process could, think, um, could help us to think how to uh, create or to develop interventions to decrease intergroup bias in children. This is the, um, the article who was published in Social Development, and this is the scan of the preprint if you want to develop. Um, thank you very much. We have some time for questions. I see one in the back. Hi, thank you for this presentation. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Um, so uh, let me try to propose an alternative uh, <laughs> explanation. Is it possible that uh, that we punish more uh, the in-group members because they associate them to the same behavior. Like, it's okay if we are of the same group in the same group uh, that we lose together. Uh, because when she punishes the in-group, she also loses her candy, right? And the other in-group loses her candies. But if uh, when she punishes uh, the other group, I mean, these are, when you punish the out-group, it's not okay because uh, we're of two different groups, but we have we will have similar behaviors. I don't know if this is clear. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. if we are of the same group, we associate this to the same behavior. So it's okay if we lose together. If you, uh, it's interesting. I never thought about that. Me neither. It, just now. <laughs> I need. <laughs> Is it interesting because it's uh, it's aligned with the idea that groups uh, are used to uh, like uh, groups are used to or group serves to foster cooperation. So you see, I think that is in the same line. We gain together and we lose together. Uh, it's interesting. Thank you for your comment. So we have another question in the front. Thank you very much. Um, you used a, a minimal group paradigm. Yes. Do you think you might find a different effect if you had? kids interacting with their own peers, like, uh, you know, their own classmates versus kids from another school that they might not even like, for instance. Yeah, well, I, I don't know. <laughs> uh, in another task, we use a natural uh, group identification, actually, with, I was talking with another uh, colleagues with football, you know, just, we just, for Argentinian people, football is very important. And you, we use football players as a natural identification. Uh, so that was the first time that we use a minimal group, um, and our resu we, I, I, I guess, or I, I think that our results about intergroup bias are quite consistent, whether we use a natural uh, in-group in identification or minimal group are quite similar. But of course, I don't know. We have one more in the front. Do you think that um, these data are influenced at all by 
the country that you are testing in? Do they differ from what you might find in, say, the United States, where a lot of this research um, is sometimes done? Yeah. And in what way? It is curious because uh, m typically the reviews ask me the same. And I <laughs> ask me, okay, could you say why the, your results in Argentina, why your results in Argentina is different from the United States? And I don't know. And I have no data to explain why on even I could don't have idea and even less em uh, empirical evidence to say why we could expect difference differences between this. I mean, I, I couldn't evaluate, and even I don't know how to measure these cultural differences that maybe influence our results. Oh. That's actually all the time that we have. So let's thank our second speaker and get ready for the third.